For as long as competition has existed, there has been cheating. Whether it's using public transport instead of running a marathon or counting cards at a casino, wherever there's competition, you can bet that a specific subset of people are going to be stacking the odds in their favor. Cheating obviously exists in video games as well. Now I don't want to come out and straight up accuse anyone of cheating. I would never do such a thing. I mean, you've got people like this guy who achieve jaw-dropping high scores on Atari games like Dragon where the developers of the game have come out and said that a score of that caliber isn't even programmed into the game's code. But I'm sure it was totally legit. Now the camera's showing and I'm, I'm doing miserable. When people do interviews or media, it's like, a, I can't get below 584 or 584% straight You know what, this stick is really sensitive too. Todd, that just sounds like a bunch of excuses. There's no excuse, you have to play. Oh, okay, so, so those weren't just excuses, how interesting. Interesting. Oh, and remember that one scene in Star Wars where Boba Fett could teleport around the battlefield and instantly lock onto anyone's head and see everyone through walls? Look, here he goes now. Classic Boba Fett shooting people through solid objects. Okay, so it's clear that cheating can be a very malicious act and can straight up ruin the game for anyone with the unfortunate of being placed in a lobby with one of these scum. This is why I play video games. However, I truly believe that if you took all different forms of cheating and just shoved them into a blender, you'd get a net positive. I know it sounds weird because I just explained how cheating is a bad thing, but I do think there's a lot of good cheating in the world and we just don't really think of it. Anytime you play a game with a younger sibling and let them win, or had a sneaking suspicion that your dad was holding back an Uno hand that would make you regret being born, technically someone in that scenario is getting an unfair advantage by a subversion of the rules, and by definition, you're cheating. This helpful sort of cheating extends over into video games too. You ever play a computer in chess? Well, theoretically, you should have lost. It's statistically impossible to beat computers in chess nowadays. Even the highest grandmasters get absolutely swept by these machines. However, not to brag or anything, but I beat level 7 on Chess Master for Game Boy. Was I some secret chess prodigy whiz kid? No, I was actually kind of an idiot. The computer actively handicapped itself, however, intentionally letting me win. The game was rigged and the computer was cheating in favor of the player the entire time. However, chess is an obvious example. It's just you versus an AI opponent, so it's easy to see how and where the cheating occurs. What about a single player game that doesn't feature an AI opponent. Let's jump into the genre of 2D platformers. 2D platformers are an interesting case study for me, just because of the pure variety of games that fall under this label. You got your kitty games like Kirby and then your whatever this is. You have these beautiful games like Celeste that discuss topics that I'm sure hit really close to home for a lot of people, like what it's like to have a panic attack or how social anxiety can hold you back from making new friends. And then you got Donkey Kong Country. Now both of these games are hard as hell. They are not for the faint of heart and contain seriously difficult segments that will challenge even the most hardcore gaming veteran. But one of them is a serious commentary about depression and the other is all about losing your banana stash. Okay, maybe Donkey Kong is also about depression. Then you got your goofy games, like this one called Shovel Knight. You play as a knight with a shovel and you kill things by jumping on them with a shovel. Even this game that constantly bombards you with shovel-based puns has an underlying somber tone. As you get to play in these interactive dream sequences where you're simply tasked with save her, but Shovel Knight always wakes up right before he's reunited with Shield Knight, his love and motivation throughout the entire story. In contrast, this is a game where you jump to the beat of Eye of the Tiger, played by a mariachi band featuring the kazoo. Despite the fact that they're all 2D platformers, if we were to make a funky little Venn diagram, these four games would be on the opposite sides of the earth. They are so radically different in core mechanics, theming, and story that it's so hard to believe that they hail from the same genre. Despite this, they all have one thing in common. They all cheat. Not just that, they all cheat to help the player in remarkably similar ways. Now just like cheating anywhere else, it works best if you don't get caught. If the players actively realize that the game is helping them out without their knowledge, it breaks the illusion that the player is in control. All the achievements accomplished by the player are dwarfed, which in turn leads to a huge disconnect between the player and the game. That's why the best games are able to cheat without the player noticing. Anyone who plays video games wants to be good, but unlike competitive multiplayer, 
multiplayer games, developers in single player games are able to fudge the odds ever so slightly in the player's favor, which provides a more enjoyable experience. In pretty much every platformer, the player is in direct control of the character, and that's it. It's the game developer's purpose to try and make sure what's up here translates to what's going on here as smoothly as possible. Dying because you didn't have fast enough reaction time or because you misjudged an enemy is, albeit not a pleasant feeling, but it's one that makes you want to jump right back into playing. This is entirely different to dying some BS like swearing you pressed jump right at the ledge, but apparently you didn't, so you end up doing this sick little thing called homicide, killing not just this purple cube, but also your will to play the game. Now what is this purple cube? Well, this is my game. It doesn't have a title, any real levels, good graphics, good music, enemies, coins, a score counter, or even death. So you might be thinking, what even is this? How did I spend 10 hours learning and writing code and come out with this? Well, I spent pretty much all of my time focusing on the player's movement, and while it's definitely nowhere near 100% complete, I'd say it feels pretty smooth as of right now. When I was starting this project, I only really had four sections of player movement. Walk left, walk right, jump, and gravity. You would think that's all you need, right? I mean, all the player does in these games is move and jump, so why would the developers bother to add in extra stuff? Well, as you might have guessed, just including these basic principles makes the game feel as rough as sandpaper. Why? Well, here are just some of the ways that developers cheat for you in 2D platformers. Any 2D platformer worth its salt will have a feature implemented known as Coyote Time. Whenever you run off a ledge, there are a few frames of leeway where the game will still accept a jump input, even though the player technically shouldn't be allowed to jump because they're already off the edge. These few frames where you're technically not on solid ground but are still allowed to jump are named after, well, you know. These help eliminate these I just ran off moments I was talking about earlier. Games like Mario slow you down towards the peak of your jump, making mid-air adjustments incredibly easy. Games like Celeste will bump you onto a ledge if you dash slightly below, or allow you to wall jump if you're just a few pixels away from the wall. Controlling an 800 pound gorilla in a game that requires precise jumps, pinpoint accuracy, and exact momentum transfers sounds like an absolute nightmare. Put him underwater and congratulations, you've just entered hell. But the genius over at Nintendo decided, wait, we actually want people to enjoy our games, so they just fudged everything towards the player in these segments. Your spin attack lasts a few frames longer than the animation itself, helping out players who mistimed their attacks. The oxygen meter actually slows down when it gets closer to running out, allotting the player a bit more precious time to snag some air. Now is this technically pulling one over on the player? Yeah, but it helps the game be fun. They even cheat not just physically within the game, but game developers, specifically Nintendo, are able to trick your mind and predict what the player is going to do in certain instances. For Donkey Kong Country, they even got the game's composer, the legend David Wise, to write one of the most calming pieces of music I've ever heard for the water levels. <laughs> And just like that, I'm chilling out. It doesn't matter if I'm back to being 8 years old playing on my Game Boy eating freaking Lunchables, or if I'm back to playing the newest version of Donkey Kong on my Nintendo Switch, it's impossible to get mad while listening to this. Developers aren't just able to trick your mind via music, though. Take the most iconic level in video game history, 1-1 of the original Super Mario Bros. After pressing start, the player has nothing to do but walk, so you begin walking right. You slowly approach this Goomba, which to a first-time Mario player is a confusing sight. I mean, I know everyone now knows you just jump on this thing to kill it, but back in 1985, this could be anything. So as you're slowly walking towards it, it's getting closer. What are you going to do? And just like that, Nintendo has essentially taught you how to play their game. If this question block wasn't here, you would have just jumped over the Goomba and learned nothing. But not only did you discover how to defeat nearly every single enemy in the game, but killing three birds with one stone, Nintendo just also taught you how to activate question mark blocks and introduced coins all from one singular button press. No reading the instruction manual, annoying tutorials, or pop-up text boxes. This is how you make an accessible video game, and it's why Mario is by far and away the best-selling video game franchise of all time. Hopefully it's clear that companies like Nintendo are constantly helping out the player and essentially cheating for them. I'd like to give one final example of video game design here, and it's from my untitled game I mentioned earlier. However, I lied. It does have a title. The game is called Recoil. 
with that out of the way, let me demonstrate how a player may go about playing through the opening of a recoil. After learning how to jump in a harmless environment, the player is given a challenge. Jumping over a pit. Hey, I didn't say the challenge was hard. Well, now you find yourself here. Instinctively, the player tries to jump over the gap, but they fail. After they fall, however, they find themselves able to pick up this alluring floating gun. After running over it, two things are now apparent. They have a gun that they are able to aim with the mouse, and there's some sort of meter now visible to the top left. Unfortunately, this gun isn't helping the player get up to the ledge, so the player acts on their only remaining option, shooting this suspicious looking crate. Well, after shooting this crate, it clearly has nothing, but wait a sec, why am I now over here? On top of that, this meter, which seems to be some sort of ammo bar, is quickly regenerating. After maybe messing around with the gun a bit more, I would hope that most players are able to put the pieces together. The name of the game, the kickback effect of the gun, this constantly regenerating meter. This game isn't your typical run and gun platformer, but rather your stunted purple box has to use the recoil of the gun to reach new heights and cover terrain, and just like that, a whole new slew of cheats are in play. The gun is obviously more effective when you use it in strong bursts. Rather than weakly spamming ammo as soon as the gun recharges even just a little bit. Because of this, I implemented an overheat system where if you shoot too much and deplete the bar, you can't shoot again until you have a meaningful amount of ammo instead of just spamming out the insignificant spurts you constantly receive. It's little touches like these that, if I were to expand this idea into a legitimate game one day, would need to be implemented in order for the game to feel fun. Games are meant to be fun, which is not always fair. Video games are entirely run by computers, and computers are unforgiving. Video games are played by humans, and humans are not perfect. Whether it's missing the jump button by 1 60th of a second, or barely hitting a few pixels of a block instead of entirely clearing it, humans make mistakes, plenty of them. We make enough of these small, little, insignificant mistakes that if these computers were to punish us for them, these games would not be fun. To counteract this, the human creators of these games essentially destroy the very challenges they have just created in order to empower the player. By giving us these handicaps we didn't even know we had, the final experience ends up being more polished, forgiving, and just plain fun. All these little touches that developers put on their games help make these computers feel just a little more human.